Hi, I'm John Sovey, and this is Art and Design. Today, my guest is Jim Kelly. Jim, thanks for coming on the show. Glad to be here. Jim, I know that um, you have an upcoming event where you'll be reading one of your essays at a Hemingway um, event up in Horton Bay, Michigan, where Hemingway, Hemingway was uh, famous for writing his Nick Adams stories, and that's really where he got his start and his inspiration. Um, uh, you're going to be actually reading an essay that you did on Nelson Aldridge and his relationship with Hemingway, right? It, it, the way it, it started out, John, I was a young guy trying to write and find my own voice as a school teacher in Vermont. And I was in a junk shop trying to buy cheap furniture, and I found instead a mentor, a voice, uh, somebody that I could emulate. I got this book. Conversations with Nelson Algren, and in it, he was funny, witty, smart, rude, um, and I didn't know his work. Turns out he was a very well-known novelist. He won the very first National Book Award, and over time, when I would root out his books, this is before the internet, I would go to junk shops, I would find them, read them, and correspond with them, telling him what I admired, and saying, I write, and how do I write like you? you know, how do I get the honesty, the emotional impact of your stuff? Uh, and eventually, I picked up the phone and we would talk. And so one time I was talking to him, he was in Hackensack, New Jersey. He left Chicago and he was covering the Hurricane Carter trial. And I'd written him a letter and said, how did you find your voice? How did you become a guy that people published your stories? And I'd like to read this little letter that he wrote me, then I'll read the essay about the friendship between Algren and Hemingway. This is on paper from the Iroquois Hotel in New York City. So it says, Dear Jim Kelly, no, like Athena, I sprang full armed. Seriously, my first story was good. It was published in Story in August 1933. I received an invitation to submit a novel from Vanguard Press right after that, and the novel was published in 1935. I had no preliminary stru struggle to get into print. The novel was not good. Nonetheless, in writing, I learned how to write a novel. The second one, which you mentioned, was good. That was 1942. I honestly don't think I have ever written a bad book. I wrote one dandy, Walk in the Wild Side. So the answer to your question is that I never made the big leap you mentioned. Being published in story in those pre-TV years was the equivalent of being picked up out of the Bowery and put on the Cabot Show. Story was the showcase. It just happened. I never went back to the Bowery. So again, this is a letter that he wrote to you what year? 1979. And uh, was that the first letter he sent you? No, I have a, a series of letters. Uh, we wrote back and forth over the years. Uh, I would find a book I thought he would like. He loved Stephen Crane, but he didn't have his collected story, so I would send that. He sent me Hunter Thompson. He sent me Cormac McCarthy. He'd send me his review books. In fact, he demanded that I read Cormac McCarthy. They had the same editor, and he said, write to him. His books don't sell. He's starving to death. He would love to hear from a reader. And I corresponded with McCarthy for years. My intro was, Nelson Algren sent me your book, Satri, and he wrote back and said, I love Nelson Algren. I've emulated him forever. And I told Algren that, and he said, I didn't see it. He's better <laughs> than me. But um, the interesting thing to me about Nelson Algren as a, a man who stuck by his principles was that he was uh, a fiercely loyal man. And Hemingway was obviously, he he started writing the 30s, Hemingway would be the premier Chicago writer, and to have Hemingway support you was an amazing part of his career. And so as a part of this event, I'm not a scholar, but I have insight into the friendship between two Chicago writers. And Algren wrote a book after Hemingway's passing called Notes of a Sea Diary, Hemingway All the Way. And it's a rude, funny, interesting book. And in it, he defends Hemingway, the writer, against critics who, after Hemingway's passing, attacked him not as a writer, but as a personality. So with that, I'd like to read a brief essay about the friendship of two Chicago writers. This is called A Couple of Guys from Chicago. 
literary reputations rise and fall. Soon after Ernest Hemingway died, there were plenty of critics who decided it was time to attack the man. Not his work, his art, but the man himself. A fellow Chicago writer of a later generation, the novelist and short story writer Nelson Algren, came to his defense. In these brief remarks, I'd like to share some of what he had to say. Share it because it's true, and because cheap shots need to be called out for what they are. First, a bit of background on Algren. Coming of age in Chicago during the Depression, Algren graduated from college with a degree in journalism got a card that said he was qualified to write for newspapers and magazines. The card just then wasn't worth the paper it was printed on. He wound up riding the rails, writing short stories, seeing misery firsthand all across the country. His first novel, Somebody in Boots, didn't sell, but got noticed by serious writers. One of them was another Chicago guy, Ernest Hemingway. Algren's second novel, Never Come Morning, came out in 1942. Hemingway had this to say about it to his editor at Scribner's, Maxwell Perkins, who was visiting the Hemingways in Cuba. I think it very good, very good. It is as fine and good stuff to come out of Chicago as James Farrell's is flat, repetitious, and worthless. Not bad praise for a guy just starting out. In 1946, looking to get a Guggenheim grant to live on while he worked on his third novel, Algren's application was supported by two fellow Chicago writers, Carl Sandburg and Ernest Hemingway. He didn't get the grant, but he never forgot the support. In 1949, Algren's novel, The Man with the Golden Arm, came out. It won the very first National Book Award for Best Novel of the Year. Hemingway wrote him a letter of congratulations. He wrote it so Algren could use it for a blurb on the dust jacket. As far as I know, this is the only time Ernest Hemingway ever wrote a jacket blurb. And he did it not because he was asked to, not because he was paid to. He did it out of simple writerly respect for a fellow Chicago guy who had done a very fine piece of work. Into a world of letters where we find a fading Faulkner and that overgrown little Abner, Thomas Wolfe, casts a shorter shadow every day, Algren comes like a big destroyer. Well, one of these things is what you need and need badly. This is a man writing, and you should not read it if you cannot take a punch. Mr. Algren can hit with both hands and move around, and he will kill you if you're not awfully careful. Mr. Algren, boy, you are good. Soon after Hemingway's death, articles started popping up attacking the man. Not the artist, but Hemingway the man with the outsized personality. Articles by Norman Podhertz, Leslie Fiedler, Dwight MacDonald in particular. Algren decided to write a book in defense of Hemingway, the artist. The result was notes of a sea diary, Hemingway all the way. He jumped in a tramp steamer, visited ports all over the world, wrote of his misadventures, and of what Hemingway's writing meant, not just to him as a writer, but to anyone anywhere who read seriously. Here are the concluding paragraphs of the book, typical of Algren's humor, lyricism, and absolute need to confront hypocrisy when leveled at a friend and mentor. If I get a little misty here, it's because I hear his voice. And uh, anyway, I'll read it without weeping. At first, they distrusted his style. Then they distrusted his lack of politics. Then they distrusted his politics. Then they distrusted his drinking in public while they drank in secrecy, or as yet didn't drink at all. They distrusted his adventures. They distrusted the beard. Finally, they distrusted the smile. Yet they never came out with what they really distrusted, because the big thing with them was the money. And he never went for the money. He made the money, he liked the money. He spent the money, but he never went for the money. They had his goat, they said, because sooner or later they felt sure he'd go for the money. He bought leisure and travel and adventure and houses and boats and sporting days and easy good times. Yet he never went for the money. Had he gone for the money, they would have had his goat. As long as he didn't, he had theirs, because it left them with nothing to get hold of except his beard and his smile. The big thing with him was neither the money nor yet the mystic stream of time eternal and serene. 
nor yet those long, beautiful islands, nor yet the changeless and changeful seas. He was the historian who noted how many letters littered the field where the Austrian dead lay face down in the sun with their hip pockets empty. And he was the Austrian face down in the sun. He was the English girl dreaming herself dead in an Italian rain. He was the advanced man with purple wounds from elbow to wrist, hiding beneath the sheets in a cheap hotel. He was the chronicler of mules with their forelegs broken, drowning in the port of Smyrna. Life is the greatest left-hander we know, he said, unless it was Charlie White of Chicago. And of the American writers of our time now dead, which one, given a single choice, would you bring back? For myself, it would be Hemingway. Hemingway all the way. Like Hemingway, Algren often was often criticized for writing about people nobody else noticed or cared about. Once, in a late night phone conversation, he told me that critics were offended when he showed drug addicts and prostitutes, small town gamblers and thieves trying to live day to day with some sort of dignity, to get by and get on with things as best they could, acting as if their lives mattered. Of such critics, he had one comment, one question. When did compassion become a bad word? He posed it, paused, a writer's, a gambler's pause, then laughed his loud, raspy laugh. Algren, like Hemingway, put his life's blood in his writing. Read them, these Chicago guys, read them. So over how many years were you communicating with Nelson? Probably the last five years of his life. Um, and it was a pure and simple treat. I'd have to rub myself up. I'd get a belly full of red wine when I'd call him, and I never needed to do that because he would always say, Jim, where are you? And to my shame, I never went to visit him, and I was a poor school teacher. He lived far away. And I wished I had just hopped a bus and gone to meet him because I could ask him anything. I would say, well, what was Dylan Thomas like or John Steinbeck or what was the rift between you and Richard Wright when he moved to Paris and started writing essays on existentialism? And he'd say, he was a great fiction writer. He shouldn't have been a cafe pundit. And he knew everybody, and he was generous with his time with me. And when I would send him something that I'd written, which I didn't ask him, one time he said, you're right, right? Send me your stuff. And I had this long, like, 60-page rant that I wrote. And he wrote back, and he told me what worked and mostly what didn't. And it took me, John, 20 years to understand that, rewrite it, and that was my first publication once I understood how to do what he had told me to do when I was a very young man. So it's, if you ever had a chance to have a mentor who is wise enough to be honest with you and say, this doesn't work, but this does continue with that. Um, it's a very lucky thing. It is, and in, in as far as advice to other people, no matter if you're a writer or any other um, field of interest, you have to reach out. Yeah. And to have, I was very fortunate in a relationship with a man who was a world-class writer, but very humble, and would listen and give guidance as opposed to pontificating. Now he would tear me up with stories about writers and his own misadventures, but when it came to coaching, he was dead serious. And I miss him greatly. Well, and this, this, is, uh, this is also a big part of who you are because not just Nelson, but you've written to a lot of people. I you have. took the time and um, in some, in some ways, it's a courageous act, but for you, it's a part of it's a second nature thing. But it took time for you to realize they're all just humans. The first time <laughs> I did it, John, I was a school teacher in New Hampshire, and I was reading 19th century literature. And a buddy of mine said, "Read the now stuff." Here's this guy Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and he gave me his two books. Uh, no one writes to the Colonel and other stories, and um, Leaf Storm and other stories, and. I started teaching them to, it was a blue collar school, 80% of the kids didn't go to college. 
and I read him a story called, they really like this one story called An Old Man with Enormous Wings. And it's a fantastical Marquez story about a naked old man who flaps into town one day, falls in the mud, and people take him and put him in a cage and charge money to see him. And he speaks some funny language, and the chickens peck at him and pull his feathers off. And eventually he escapes and flies away. And while he's in town, there's a plague of crabs. And so all the, town, all the houses fill up with crabs while people are making fun and mocking this guy and turning him into a pariah, or this person who flies out of the sky. And I remember these kids were never going to read a whole lot of literature, but they got it. And one kid said, that's my life. Every day the house fills up with crabs. I get them out, and they come again. They understood what it's like to be a pariah and be picked on. And they cheered when the old man got out of the cage and flapped away. To them, it was a sense of people look down on us. Our families don't have any money. We're struggling. And I see in their eyes that they disrespect my father, me, my clothes, where we live. And I wrote that to Marquez and asked him to sign the book. I'll get weak when I do this. But anyway, he wrote back. And he wrote this big, long thing in Spanish. Then he translates it. All this literary leaf storm for Jim from his friend. And that started me on doing it. And it became a habit. I did it for years. And I've written to writers all over the world. And part of the delight of it is not, again, I get weak when I do this stuff. <laughs> it's not sending a book because of its value. But the literary value is how it moves me. And so I would write to a Peruvian novelist, a Dublin short story writer, uh, a Southern poet, an Irish poet, and explain exactly what it was that moved me about their work. And so we would correspond back and forth about not just, oh, here's your book, thank you, but commentary about what I had said. I once wrote to um, Arthur Miller about a play he wrote, not Death of a Salesman, it was a later one. And it just, it had my father in it. I mean, it was, when I read it, it knocked me out. It was his relationship with his older brother and how he always felt secondary to his older brother. And I said, this is what I see in this. It's, this is why I love this play. And he wrote back and said, I, I put all of that in it years ago because of my relationship with my, my father. So what I found was that writers, no matter how famous, rarely necessarily hear from readers who are moved by their work. And when they do, they respond. Um, Tennessee Williams wrote back when I wrote to him about his story, The Yellow Bird, which is a fantastical story. And he said, I'm delighted you read this. I didn't know anybody read those things anymore. And here's such a famous writer saying, thanks for letting me know that what I did, who knows how many years ago, has had an effect on you. Uh, and that was part of the treat of it, um, to communicate with people who you would think would be above any kind of openness to talk. And they would, I found much generosity of spirit from writers around the world. Which, especially after you're talking about reading something that moved you, and then to have them be authentic in their response, um, it's kind of reassuring about a lot of things when, that, when you get the, a letter back like that. <laughs> it is, and it's... It's rare, too. <laughs> and also to come home you know, from a sales job with a suit, and there'd be this lump in the mailbox, and it might be from who knows where. Wonderful stamps from some foreign country, and I'd tear it open, and it might be from Colombia, Mexico City, often from Dublin, but sometimes from Jackson, Mississippi, from Eudora Welty. And it was just wonderful. Well, and those exchanges are the fuel for your own writing as well, right? They are, because it, it suggests that no matter how famous a person becomes as a writer, they're still just the person struggling to get it right. And they're sending back and saying, you can do this too. Just don't try and be me. Don't try and be somebody else. Try and be yourself. And over time, it took me a very long time to learn how to do that. But uh, without that 
correspondence with people who were successful at it and who I greatly admired, I don't know that I would have continued. Um, it just, I'm a very slow learner. It took me a long time <laughs> to trust what I had been told repeatedly over the years from writers that I admired, which is just find your own voice and work with it. Don't try to be somebody else. Where are you at with that in the process right now? Well, I have a, a second collection of stories that's out to university presses. And so far, nobody's bit, but that's OK. I keep writing and sending mm -hmm. stuff out. Right now, I probably have 30, 35 stories out to different literary magazines across the country and in different countries. And uh, I do it because I love to do it. Um, one quick question about that. I know that you're, uh, um, you try and make it a universal. And I'm referring to Pitchman's Blues where it's not actual events or actual occurrences or actual references to things that you've done, you're trying to make it, um, what, what, why that approach as opposed to more autobiographical type things? Well, what I found, John, is in writing, um, when I tried to write a story directly from life, it was like journalism. It was boring. It was a ho-hum, why should anybody care? But if I, started to write where the sound of the writing initiated itself and I was working with sound, and then the story I wrote would be based on one or two events, maybe three events, but they all kind of blended and morphed and, and swirled together. And so instead of having something which was straight narrative journalist autobiographical, it became more um, an investigation of whatever the emotional truth was around the kernel of the story. Um, and so I've always said, when somebody says, I could write a book, I've got a great story to tell, I say, maybe, maybe not. The fact that something happened doesn't mean it's a good story or even worth telling or listening to. But the process of storytelling is, how do you get something that is emotionally honest and true to work? Hardest thing I can think of, but the most fun to try and do. And I, I, I have a question between storytelling and journalism. Is, are they the same? Yes. OK. All it's right. all structure. Yeah. Um, when I wrote for business, I would structure things. When you write journalism, you're selecting, pruning. It's all storytelling. Uh, one of my favorite professors in college had been a journalist. And he said, I don't trust anything I read in the newspapers because how many times late on a Sunday did they say you have three columns to fill? And I'd pick up the phone and call three people and they'd say, he'd say, 80% of those polled said, and he had to fill his columns. So yeah, it's all storytelling. So why is it that I love your story so much? <laughs> well, hopefully the ones that you like are the ones where I've stepped aside from trying to just be this happened, this happened, and try to inhabit a moment that has some sort of an emotional truth to it. Well, I think you've tapped into it. And my whole thing is to spend your whole life interested in other people and still interested in other people, but also using it for your own purpose, which is to become a better writer. I mean, um, I can't tell you how much you've influenced me in your approach and how many times I've done things that we talked about 30 years ago, and still do to this day. Um, I don't know. I'm a big fan of what you've done and how you've crafted your life around this to ensure that you can continue to do it the rest of your life, too, where a lot of people can't even figure out what they want to do. I don't know, you know what I'd do if I didn't read and write. Um, I've never, I never saw myself as a guy who had a career. I mean, they rented my behavior, I went out and I did stuff, and I was a salesman for a long time, was a teacher for a long time. But inside, I've always seen myself as a person who wants to express things, get stories out that work. And I, I did it as a little kid, as a teenager. I started writing stories when I was probably 14 or 15. And it's just something that there's Jim the writer, then there's Jim the guy that does other stuff. and. Uh, in retirement, I'm able to, I don't have to preserve it, I can just become Jim the writer when I want to be. Well, I'm not even going to give you the retirement thing. I think this has been your career the whole time. And like you said, they've rented you 
and um, now you just have a little bit more free time to pursue what it is that you want to do and you're doing it and you're taking advantage of it. That's a life well lived in my opinion and you are someone to be emulated and I am so glad we had this chance to talk about Well, I'm always Sunday. delighted to talk with you, a fellow book lover. <laughs> Well, you, you have no idea the influence you've had on me. Jim, thanks for coming on today. And again, Labor Day weekend, I know you're going to be doing this Hemingway conference yep. and, and actually actually reading the, uh, the two guys from Chicago uh, essay that you just shared with us. So thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, and I look forward to the Hemingway event.